In 2018, the Sittingbourne Heritage Museum's study group, which researches local history topics, decided to undertake a survey of Bobbing Churchyard. Helen Allenson is the leader of the group. The Bobbing project came about because we were asked by the Vicar of Bobbing if we could record the tombstone inscriptions there because she got a lot of people coming to ask about their ancestors. Where were they buried? Had they got a tombstone? And we felt that our history um, group, our study group, could really help with that. Um, we're doing this because so many of the gravestones are becoming unreadable. They need to be preserved for future generations. Undigitised individual church burial records are now held at the Kent History and Library Centre. But our work would provide the church with a record which could be consulted when descendants visit. This wasn't the first time that historian Helen Allenson had undertaken a similar survey. My interest in Borden um, Churchyard began in the 1970s when we used to attend Borden Church and I used to read some of the inscriptions and it made me wonder about the lives of those people. In and around 1980 she had, with others, recorded the names on the tombstones in Borden Village Churchyard and then in 1994 had also surveyed Bredger Churchyard. The results of these two earlier surveys have been stored and are already invaluable, since many of the graves have become illegible since that time. Both had come about because she was writing histories of the villages, and the tombstones provided an extra layer of information and interest. The group working at Bobbing met for two or three hot sunny July afternoons with teams of two or three people tackling sections of the graveyard. There are more than 360 memorial gravestones in Bobbing Churchyard. The project wasn't easy because it was a very hot summer, almost too hot to do anything. But Bobbing was interesting because it was so dry that it was showing up a lot of the hidden graves. You could see um, like a parch mark of where the stones were hidden underneath and we were able to probably find more than we would have done in a normal year. John Hepburn had created a plan of the churchyard and divided the seemingly haphazard layout into sections or plots with the locations of graves marked and each grave given a number within that section. This was found to be an invaluable prerequisite for the survey as it gives everyone a reference and a method of organising the work. The physical plan is rather uh, handwritten shall we say but that enables us to get the reference points within the graveyard to help the researchers and also to uh, orientate yourself as to where you are in the lines of graves so we would pick out prominent trees and graves that have unusual headstones such as with hearts and crosses and anything else that would give the researchers a reference point and help them. The work was undertaken in warm weather and it was not light work by any means. First, the nettles and grass needed to be cut and what ivy could be removed safely. Of course, not everyone is happy to work with nettles and ivy and suitable clothing is needed as well as a few simple tools. Something to kneel on, to take secateurs and trowels of different sizes was quite a useful thing to have and of course a bottle of water. From a conservation point of view, merely removing ivy, moss or lichen could, if not done carefully, damage the memorials, even though it could be argued the ivy and the lichen are themselves damaging the memorial lettering. I suddenly realised that I was going to have to grovel around on the ground and use secateurs and trowels to discover what had been hidden there in many cases for many years. Some types of lettering are more susceptible to damage than others, with lettering that falls out of the tombstone or carved letters in soft stone that becomes crumbly. Physically, there are a number of hazards. It's quite tricky working in a graveyard. There are so many pitfalls. You can fall down a hole, trip over a, a hidden stone. Um, so many of them are, are down below the, the actual level of the ground. So you can end up with all sorts of problems, um, damages to yourself apart from anything else. Some of the gravestones are leaning and you shouldn't approach these. Always be aware that having sat for a hundred years or so, someone walking too close or leaning on the headstones for example could well cause them to fall, causing serious injury and of course damage to the headstone. 
In some cases, the local council have marked the graves as unsafe and attached warning notices. These should especially be avoided. The gravestones range in age from 18th century to just a year or two old. Each grave or memorial, depending on its age, is likely to be partly legible and partly illegible, and it can be that legibility can be improved with soft brushing or with the application of water. Some graves are very much easier to read than others. Um, some of them have got a nice upright headstone. Others have got um, pieces down the side written which have been covered by grass, weeds, etc. So um, there are definitely ones that are better to read. Uh, to make it more readable, to start with, we usually try and gently lift any, um, any growth on it, any ivy or overgrown grass um, using a, a small trowel and then we can uh, put water on it when we just give it a brushing and um, that will lift up quite often the wording that is underneath. Once clear, the graves were systematically photographed by Colin Benson and his granddaughter and here the grave numbering was important so that the graves could be identified against the photographs later on, even if the name on the memorial proved to be illegible. In some cases, the memorial lettering can be read on a photograph later at some magnification, more easily than with the naked eye, but in the majority of cases, we have preferred to record what we can read on the day in sunlight. Combining the data from Bredgar, Borden and Bobbing churchyards, we realised that we had a useful resource for people searching for relatives in the villages. The data is stored initially in a spreadsheet, so that it can be checked for dates and other details that may be almost illegible, using online databases such as findmypast.com or Ancestry UK. The internet checking process is just an additional uh, reference that we use because obviously some of the graves uh, don't have complete information or on some that we've come across some of the numbers have actually fallen away and just left partial dates and partial names. Eventually, the details are imported into a database so that the data can be searched on any of the fields, surname, date of death and so on. And reports or printouts can be produced in alphabetical, chronological or geographical order as required. In 2020, after several months of lockdown and watching television, the group decided to tackle the extension churchyard at Bredgar. This was a good warm-up for future projects, since the graveyard is relatively small and ordered with a simple layout. Nevertheless, John's plan and numbering was again a most essential starting point. In photographing this cemetery, I found that two or three images might be needed, since the detailed inscriptions are sometimes around the edge of the grave, as well as or instead of on a headstone. The resulting database is not yet available online, but it is a tool by which we can answer our members' genealogy queries quickly and efficiently. In most cases, a photograph is available for those who cannot get to the cemetery themselves, such as inquirers who live abroad. We hope to expand our database over the coming months and years. It is possible that the Church of England project will overtake our work in years to come, although due to the inevitable continued decline in the condition of the graves and memorials, it's unlikely to be as comprehensive. In the meantime, our project continues. Because it was discovering something new that I didn't know about. Yeah, it, there's a lot there. That, some interesting ones, some very interesting ones, which would have been lost for a long time. And I thought at the end of it that those people's names, in many cases, perhaps had been forgotten for many years and just for a few hours we were thinking about those people. If you have found this video interesting, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit our website.